Hey everyone, it is Monday the 30th of March. I'm back in on shift. If you've been following me on my community tab, you'll know I'm supposed to be on the night shift today, but I had a call from the hospital to say they're a bit short on the evening shift. So I've come in early. I was reading last night about the first doctor to die in the UK and the statement from the family was incredibly touching. I wanted to talk about that before I started the vlog today and read what his family said because it really moved me quite a lot actually but obviously I've been called in to cover this shift so those things have to wait and I'm sure that's you know what what his family and what he would have wanted us to crack on so I'm going to uh, chat about that when I get back and um, reflect on that then so we're back in the emergency department I've got 50% chance of being on the COVID side 50% chance of being on the non-COVID side Let's see what happens and I'll keep you updated. It's also National Doctors Day today as well. So big shout out to anyone who's in healthcare, particularly at this time. These kind of national days are a bit of a funny old thing, but it feels like every day is kind of a healthcare day at the moment. I feel like we're getting so much support. Another shift done. As you can tell by not having a mid shift chat, I was on the non-COVID side. So the A&E has been divided into two sections. So I was looking after patients with general medical and surgical problems, but not related to COVID-19. Everything looks to be going smoothly. We're still having lots of patients admitted with the virus, but teams are working well. Everyone's rising to the challenge here. I know things are very different across the country depending on the hospitals because we had our cases slightly later than places like london we are really benefiting from the social distancing that everyone's been doing and as i said all along the public are responding really well by staying away if they don't need help meaning we can concentrate our resources on the people that really need it so all in all a very good shift i'm gonna head back and we'll chat about what we said we'd do this morning Hi guys, welcome back. I've just had a shower and chilling out before bed and I really wanted to talk about the first doctor to die in the UK from coronavirus. Many people are suffering from the illness, many people have died from the illness and we can get wrapped up in the numbers and forget there's actual people behind that and families behind that. So the first doctor in the UK to die was Dr Amjad Al Harani, a 55 year old ENT surgeon. I just wanted to read this moving tribute that his family have put out here. It said he was a much loved husband, son, father, brother and friend who made a difference to thousands of lives. He was the rock of our family, incredibly strong, compassionate, caring and giving. He always put everyone else before himself. We all turned to him when we needed support and he was always there for us. He had so many responsibilities and yet he never complained. We would like to thank all those involved in his care for their kindness and compassion during his illness. They worked tirelessly for their patient as he would have done for his own. Losing Amjad is devastating for our family. Life without him is impossible to imagine, but together we will do all we can to honour his memory and live how, we, how he would have wanted us to. My heart goes out to the family and all the friends of clearly this incredible doctor, incredible man, clearly a huge tragic loss to their family and you know, a huge loss to the many patients that, that he would have looked after and would have continued to look after. You know, this is really scary for doctors, particularly consultants, um, senior consultants that are still on the front line and still seeing patients. When we talked to Dr. Jenkins yesterday, we know that age is a risk factor for some of the complications. One of the concerns that is coming up in amongst the doctor circles I'm talking about but isn't necessarily coming across in a lot of the media at the moment. And that's probably because we don't have a lot of answers. So this isn't a scientific look at it, it's just what people are talking about. And that's the idea of healthcare professionals being subjected to an increase of viral load. And therefore, does that equate to complications? So what do I mean by that? So the viral load is how much virus someone has on them. So when the virus is replicating in your, th your nose, throat and mouth, how much virus is then coming out into your secretions and is then therefore able to infect someone else. So a huge viral load means you're more likely to infect someone else, right? There's also the idea of the infectious dose. So the infectious dose is kind of how much of a virus you need to end up getting the illness. If you breathe in just one virus particle, it's unlikely to give you any problems. 
So you need a certain amount of the virus in you, and that's what's called the infectious dose, to be able to cause the disease. So the viral load and infectious dose are important concepts in how contagious, so how likely a disease is to spread. So if you're producing lots, got a high viral load, you're more likely to spread it. And also if it only needs a small amount to cause disease, so a small infectious dose, then the virus is more likely to be spread because just small amounts that come in contact with you, you're more likely to get the illness. There's also other concepts as well, like how it's actually spread, mean how contagious it is. But one question on every healthcare professional's mind is, if someone has got a very high viral load and you're subjected to that, does the amount of infectious dose you get off that correlate to the disease you get? And that's a key question I, I don't think we have the answer to. I think many of us doctors are assuming that the higher the infectious dose you get exposed to, the more likely you are to get complications and a severe disease. I mean, that's certainly true for um, viruses such as influenza. And I think there's even been animal studies on other types of coronavirus like SARS and MERS that have shown that to be true as well. And that's a real concern, right? Because doctors are inevitably gonna be more exposed to the virus. Therefore, we're more likely to get a higher dose. Therefore, we're more likely to get complications. So we're not just more likely to catch it, you know, are we more likely to get complications from it as well? And tying this back to the tragic case of Dr. El Harani, an ear, nose and throat surgeon, he's likely have been working very close to patients and maybe people we didn't know had coronavirus. Now, I don't know if that's the case, but these are the concerns for doctors. So don't forget, a lot of people now actually had the disease but don't have symptoms. So if we're examining those patients close up, we might get exposed to a large infectious dose and therefore more likely to get the complications. As I have to say, this isn't a kind of scientific review of the literature. I, I think we don't have that kind of information at the moment, but I'm just talking about what people are concerned with on the ground. You know, assuming this is the case and knowing this, how does it change what you do? Well, it shouldn't really change a lot, really. We still need to be using personal protective equipment, but I feel like it's the asymptomatic patients, the ones that are in for other things. So I was working in just a general A&E majors. I wasn't on the, the side that was seeing the respiratory isolated patients, so the ones that had uh, suspicion of COVID-19. Really try and limit my exposure in any way with patients, even if they're asymptomatic. Also, when I was working on the COVID side, I really limited my examination. I did a video last week where we typically do a history and examination on a patient. Well, I'm definitely limiting the amount I examine, so I tend not to listen to people's chests if they have a obvious COVID-19 infection. You can really tell by the history, the observations, and the end of the bed inspection. And really, we're gonna be getting the chest X-ray as well to help diagnosis. Now, that's not traditionally how we do medicine, but I found that when I was auscultating, so listening with my stethoscope to the patient's back, the patient's got a mask on and they're breathing into that mask and the air's coming back at you as you're listening. That did not seem like a suitable thing for me to be doing. So that's something that I've modified. I don't know if that's a general recommendation amongst the medical community, but you have to be sensible with these things. It's important to note that I don't know the circumstances around Dr. El Harani's death, whether he caught the virus from a patient during a clinical examination or from some other means. I don't know if we'll ever find that information out, but I did want to highlight some of the difficulties that we go through when we expose ourselves to patients, particularly in the profession such as an ear, nose and throat surgeon, because they're gonna be in that area where the virus is spread. Just to say, we are gonna see other healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, other people that work in the NHS that will have tragic outcomes in this. And it, it's gonna be, it's part of the challenge that we're gonna face. We'd have to do what all these people would want us to do, and that is to just care the best we can, do the best job we can for the patient in front of us. Hopefully this video again is a reminder of why we're all making the sacrifice, all doing the social distancing, all doing the quarantining properly. And if you are good on you, I'm off to bed now. I've got an afternoon shift tomorrow as well. I'll keep you posted. I hope you're all well. Take care of yourselves and thank you again for all the support. So here we are in the well-being room, hydration and biscuits. So I've been on the COVID 
side today and yeah it's a lot more full on than yesterday on the non-COVID side. Seeing loads of patients, a variety of ages and they're all coming in with those chest x-ray signs, all hypoxic, that means they've got very low oxygen levels. It's pretty heartbreaking to see so many patients coming in and being at the start of their journey and not knowing which way they're going to go. We've already had some that need to go straight to intensive care unit. And we're trying to limit the amount of staff that go in to see them. So when I go in to review them, I'm frequently doing a lot more things than I'd normally do. So normally we'd see patients in a team, so the nurses do a lot of the, you know, the blood taking, observations, but we're trying to limit the amount of people that are in at any one time. So it's taken a lot longer to see patients, as Dr Jenkins said when we spoke to him on Sunday. The amount of PPE we've got, we're, my trust is actually doing higher levels than the national recommendation, which I massively appreciate. I feel much more protected. I feel like the trust is behind us. I know there are supply issues, so we have to be extremely careful with it, and that's also why we're few of us are going in to see the patient, so we're limiting the amount of PPE we're using. That's personal protective equipment like masks, gloves, gowns, that type of thing. So I think the national recommendation is we wear this kind of plastic apron, but that doesn't protect your neck, your arms. We're wearing full gowns, so I do appreciate the trust sort of taken on board our concerns about that. We have a really good team on as well. The morale is very high, but it, it does feel more intense than a normal day, even though I'm seeing probably fewer patients that I'd normally see, purely because it's taken me a lot longer to do everything because you're having to do everything yourself and a few times I have made mistakes so I haven't put the blood pressure cuff to automatically cycle which means someone has to gown up and go in again but these are things that are going to happen when you're not used to doing certain things. Another change as well is when I came on shift they took our temperatures before we started so if we did have a fever they'd send us home and also What's really good is testing is happening now. So a couple of my colleagues that have had symptoms are being tested, which is absolutely brilliant. Because if it comes back negative, then they can get, when their symptoms are off, can get straight back onto the shift rather than having to isolate for you know, an extended amount of time. Because the number of doctors, we are a number of doctors down, and clearly that's going to represent other healthcare workers as well. So that is a big concern, I think. And I know the shifts have changed as well, so they're rotary more doctors to be on each day. And that's not necessarily to do with demand, it's to do with the number of doctors they expect to go off um, with isolating. So, we're getting, so the rotors that have been released are actually much more demanding on, on the staff here, but that's just because some of them won't be in because they're um, going to be self-isolating. What do you think of the wellness room? It's actually really nice and pleasant. Good little... Place to really have got some lovely artwork on the wall as well. That looks like Venice. Is it Venice? Probably got that really wrong. We can peer at this nice tranquil scene. Didn't quite have the masseuse that I thought <laughs> I thought it could have. I'm gonna go get some food now. Also, so many of you requested could you see the Lego hospital that Sonia built? So I'm gonna try and get some food and try and show you that as well. So here is the hospital that Sonia built. We've got our garden out here with our ambulance, our super paramedic team. I guess this is A&E down the bottom, so this is where I work in. <laughs> Going up here, da -da -da -da. we have the ICU. Ah, we know it's the ICU because can we see here? Who do we have here? It's Iron Woman, Sonia, <laughs> in the ICU. Look at this, in one of the departments, in the ICU, we have someone in a hazmat suit in full PPE. Then further up here, we have our X-ray area. The X-ray here is actually a skeleton. <laughs> and our general ward as well. Then finally at the top here, we have our helipad, which I think Prince William's even landed on our helipad a few times. That's Prince William there chilling out. <laughs> so there you go. Another shift has come to an end. Probably the hardest one to date so far and the one that has kind of brought it all into reality. All those sort of small changes we've had over the last week have add up to an environment, a working environment that is really unlike anything I've worked in before. It's not necessarily the number of patients we're seeing because 
pretty much half the patients we're seeing are COVID patients, but we can manage that at the moment. It's all the changes that are brought about by trying to stop you know, the staff being infected and to stop the patients with it from infecting other patients and other people in the hospital. So everything takes a lot longer to do. You know, a lot longer to see patients. You have to work a lot more independently with them. And you probably noticed uh, when I talked uh, halfway through the shift there that I didn't have my stethoscope on. So normally the, the tool that every doctor needs to listen to chest, we're not carrying stethoscopes anymore. Like I said on the vlog last night, we're actually encouraged not to examine patients to, to keep our distance, which I kind of thought I you know, came to my own conclusion, but that's really what we're now being instructed to do from above, which is really good and shows they are you know, putting us first really obviously in medicine we always put the patient first but actually now we need to protect the workforce otherwise who's going to look after the patients and then know there are issues with PPE with staffing levels but I do think my hospital are doing the best they can with providing us you know the, the best working environment possible one scary thing is how rapidly patients can deteriorate Kind of right in front of you in A&E. I've said before on the channel that I feel quite lucky being in A&E because I'm unlikely to see patients really struggling but that's definitely not the case you know from the patients I saw today. Some of them came in clearly unwell but within a couple of hours of me ordering investigations and blood tests were in a lot worse condition. That's the kind of scary thing and something I didn't really appreciate. I thought that type of deterioration would be really what my colleagues would see in other areas like on the wards and, and in the intensive care unit but this is a nasty nasty infection and when you get sort of relatively young and fit people they'll compensate for a long amount of time so their their lungs and heart are, are strong so they'll they'll keep going for a long amount of time until it can't go along any further and then we'll see that deterioration in things like their oxygen levels so it was a bit of an eye-opener today i think this day is definitely more of an indication of what i'm going to see going forward such a different vibe from yesterday when i was on the non-covid section so it's nice that we'll be able to rotate in between those different sections to get some respite a couple of other little changes is we've been allowed to wear masks, just normal surgical masks, even when we're not seeing patients, which I find really good. I know there's not necessarily evidence for it, but at the very least, it stops me touching my face so much. So, you know, that's an important way that things are transmitted, particularly in an environment where, OK, we're cleaning down lots of the areas, but we can't guarantee that there isn't contamination on a lot of the things we're touching. Those fomites that we talked about, I feel so lucky doing this vlog and have so many people you know responding in the comments thanking healthcare workers and I'm seeing that love that people are love and support that people have for us I know a lot of healthcare workers around the world and in the UK here are going through a hell of a lot worse than we're seeing at my hospital and you know they don't necessarily have that in the front of their mind how much support that the public are giving but I, I can see it and hopefully other healthcare professionals looking at the vlog can you know pick up on those vibes on, on what you guys are giving me. I've got a day off tomorrow so I'm gonna kick it back take it easy and I'll see you later on in the week.